Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando Florido, a GP in the United Kingdom. Today we'll be exploring the world of NICE guidelines and how they apply to a complex patient. But this isn't just any patient. This one was randomly created by the latest bugs in town, ChatGPT. Our focus will be on the pharmacological treatment. Before we dive in, I'd like to make it clear that I'm not here to provide medical advice. Rather, I'll be sharing my interpretation of the guidelines with fellow healthcare professionals. Please always use your clinical judgment when treating your patients. For those of you who are on the go and prefer a different format, we've also got a podcast version of these videos. You can find the link in the episode description below. All right, let's generate a random patient using ChatGPT. It was created using a specific prompt, which is available in the episode description. Let's get started. Right, so our fictitious patient is Sarah Johnson, a 52-year-old African-American woman. Sarah is currently obese with a BMI of 31 and her blood pressure is above the target at 142 over 88. She has a medical history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension, which are both poorly controlled, as well as osteoarthritis, which is well controlled with ibuprofen, asthma, which is well controlled with albutamol inhaler, and depression, which is well controlled with fluoxetin. Her regular medications are metformin 1000 mg twice a day for diabetes, lisinopril 20 mg once a day for hypertension, atorvastatin 40 mg once a day for dyslipidemia, ibuprofen 400 mg twice a day for osteoarthritis, salbutamol inhaler 2 puffs as needed for asthma, and fluoxetin 20 mg once a day for depression. Fortunately, she tolerates all medications well without any side effects. We also have a blood test results, which show the following. An HbA1c of 8.5% or 69 millimole per mole, a creatinine of 94, an eGFR of 72, with normal urea and electrolytes, a total cholesterol of 6.1, and an LDL cholesterol of 4.1, all other lipids and thyroid function tests were normal. Finally, Sarah's Q-Risk 2 score is 20%, indicating a high risk of developing cardiovascular disease over the next 10 years. Upon initial examination, this 52-year-old woman presents with a significant amount of multimorbidity. Her obesity is likely exacerbating her conditions, particularly her diabetes, hypertension and osteoarthritis, and may also be contributing to her depression through disability and ill health. Given this, tackling her obesity could potentially have a positive impact on her overall health. However, for the purpose of this case, we will focus on the pharmacological treatment rather than lifestyle interventions. It is worth noting that the patient's EGFR of 72 indicates stage 2 CKD, which will factor into our treatment decisions. We will assume that there is no significant microalbuminuria since ACR results are not available. Additionally, the patient has a high risk of cardiovascular disease, so managing her conditions aggressively will also help mitigate this risk. Moving on to her poorly controlled diabetes, which is currently being treated with metformin 1 gram twice a day and has an HbA1c of 8.5% or 69 millimoles per mole, NICE guidelines recommend an SGLT2 inhibitor as step to treatment after metformin for patients at high risk of cardiovascular disease. SGLT2 inhibitors are also beneficial for those with CKD and can promote weight loss, so a good option for this patient. In this case, starting the patient on something like dapaglifosin 5 mg once daily initially and potentially increasing to 10 mg daily within a few weeks, if well tolerated, will be a suitable option. It is important to note that SGLT2 inhibitors have been associated with an increased risk of DKA, toe and lower limb amputation and Fournier gangrene. Fournier's gangrene is a rare but life-threatening type of necrotizing fasciitis which specifically affects the genital and perineal area. The condition develops rapidly and symptoms may include fever, severe pain, redness, swelling and foul-smelling discharge in the affected area. The infection can spread quickly and cause significant tissue damage leading to sepsis, shock and organ failure if not treated promptly. Therefore, it is crucial to educate the patient on DKA symptoms, advice against starting a ketogenic diet while taking an SGLT2 inhibitor, 
as this increases the risk of DKA, and promote excellent food care. Additionally, we should advise the patient to seek urgent medical advice if they experience severe pain, erythema or swelling in the genital or perineal area, while GLP-1 receptor agonists would be recommended for patients with high cardiovascular risk following the European and American guidelines. The NICE guidelines are more restrictive in this respect. However, an SGLT2 inhibitor is still an effective and straightforward option for this patient. Now that we have addressed her diabetes, let's move on to her hypertension. We'll be treating our patient's clinic blood pressure as accurate in accordance with NICE guidelines. If a patient has been diagnosed with hypertension, we don't need to use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring unless there are concerns. But for patients with diabetes, both sitting and standing blood pressure should be checked due to the risk of postural hypertension, especially if affected by autonomic neuropathy. Our patient is being treated with an ACE inhibitor, lisinopril 20 mg daily, which aligns with NICE guidance. For people with diabetes of any age and ethnicity background, an ACE inhibitor or ARB is recommended as first-line treatment, giving a protective effect on the kidneys. This is especially important for patients with early stages of CKD, like our patient. I'd like to mention that our patient takes ibuprofen regularly for osteoarthritis. However, this is concerning for two reasons. One, it can increase blood pressure, and two, it's a nephrotoxic drug which can worsen CKD. We'll discuss this more when reviewing her osteoarthritis treatment. Our patient's blood pressure is 142 over 88. NICE says that the target blood pressure for people under the age of 80 is below 140 over 90, making her reading borderline. Okay, what would I do? We are starting her on dapaglifosin for her diabetes, so we could see what happens to her blood pressure. SGLT2 inhibitors, due to their diuretic effect, can sometimes have a blood pressure lowering effect, especially when giving in combination with antihypertensive agents such as ACE inhibitors. We are probably going to advise this patient to stop or drastically reduce the use of ibuprofen, so that may also have a positive effect on her blood pressure. Because her current blood pressure is not desperately high, we could afford to wait for a few weeks to see if her blood pressure drops spontaneously with these measures. What would I do if the blood pressure remained above target? We know that the dose of lisinopril can be increased to 40 mg and up to a maximum of 80 mg daily. However, we also know that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are generally less effective as monotherapy in patients of African or African-Caribbean family background because these patients have a tendency towards a low renin state and a lower cardiac output, together with increased peripheral resistance. So should we increase a dose of lisinopril or should we start on a combination with, for example, a calcium channel blocker? We know that calcium channel blockers are the preferred choice for patients of African and African-Caribbean family background if they do not have diabetes. You can obviously assess their individual circumstances, but in general, it would be better to optimize the dose of lisinopril to the maximum tolerated dose and increase it further if possible. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are important in the treatment of chronic kidney disease and avoiding these drugs in African-Caribbean patients may inadvertently contribute to worse outcomes for CKD in these patients. Moving on to her osteoarthritis, we don't know which joints are affected, but we do know her symptoms are well controlled on regular ibuprofen 400mg twice a day. It's important to keep in mind that NICE recommends the following. 1. A non-pharmacological approach should be attempted first. This involves ensuring that the patient has engaged with physiotherapy and weight loss strategies. If the patient has not received support for these, they should be referred accordingly. 2. If non-pharmacological management has not been effective, a topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug should be offered for knee osteoarthritis and it should be considered for other osteoarthritis affected joints. If this treatment has not been tried before, we should recommend it to the patient. 3. If topical treatment is not effective, NICE suggests using other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs orally 
only at the lowest effective dose and for the shortest possible time. We should review whether to continue treatment regularly. For instance, if the patient is taking ibuprofen regularly, we should assess whether they could cope with intermittent use or a lower dose of, say, 200 mg twice a day. And four, finally, if the patient requires regular non anti-inflammatory drugs orally, it should be given with gastroprotection to minimize the risk of upper gastrointestinal bleeding. Therefore, we should be prescribing a proton pump inhibitor, such as omeprazole, 20 mg daily, as long as she's taking ibuprofen. Additionally, NICE advises against the use of paracetamol or weak opioids in osteoarthritis unless they're used infrequently for short-term pain relief and all other treatments have been ineffective or unsuitable. Now let's look at her hyperlipidemia and her cure-based score of 20%. We know that she has no history of cardiovascular disease, so we are assessing her for primary prevention. We should normally assess the patient's Q-Risk 2 score before starting a statin. After starting a statin, we should focus on the decrease of non-HDL cholesterol with statin therapy instead of the actual Q-Risk 2 score, since by starting a statin, we already know that the patient is at high risk. Let's take a closer look at the NICE guidelines on this subject. NICE recommends using the Q-Risk tool to assess cardiovascular risk for primary prevention in individuals up to the age of 84, including those with type 2 diabetes. However, it's not suitable for people already at high risk due to other medical conditions such as pre-existing cardiovascular disease, type 1 diabetes, CKD with an EGFR less than 60 and or macrobinuria, familial hypercholesterolemia or other genetic causes. For patients like this one with a Q-risk score of 10% or higher, NICE recommends offering atorvastatin 20 mg for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in addition to lifestyle advice. After starting atorvastatin 20 mg daily, we'll recheck the patient's lipids after three months and assess non-HDL cholesterol reduction if non-HDL cholesterol hasn't decreased by more than 40%, will reinforce lifestyle advice and adherence and consider increasing the dose of atorvastatin to 40 mg daily, and later on up to 80 mg daily if the patient is at high risk due to comorbidities or we assess her as such using our clinical judgment. Regarding this particular patient, we assume that the score is pretreatment and even though she's taking 40 mg of atorvastatin, her lipids are still high. We need to check a pretreatment non-HDL cholesterol to see if the 40% drop has been achieved. If not, we may consider increasing the dose to 80 mg daily. Before we move on, let's quickly summarize what NICE recommends for patients already on statins. We'll measure liver transaminase enzymes before starting a statin within three months of starting or increasing the dose, and again at 12 months, but not again unless clinically indicated. We will need to consider annual non-fasting blood tests for non-HDL cholesterol to inform discussions during our annual reviews with the patient. We should not offer a statin in combination with fibrates, nicotinic acid, or bile acid sequestrant. However, combining with acetimide may be appropriate for patients with primary hypercholesterolemia. Now let's turn our attention to the patient's asthma. The history says that her asthma is well controlled with on-demand reliever therapy as needed. In this case, salbutamol inhaler two parts when required. According to NICE guidelines, patients with infrequent short-lived wheeze and normal lung function can be treated with sample reliever therapy alone. However, if symptoms indicate the need for maintenance therapy, for example, asthma-related symptoms occurring three or more times a week, or symptoms causing waking at night, a low dose of an inhaled corticosteroid, such as standard beclomethasone 100 micrograms, one or two inhalations twice daily, should be offered. Moving on to her depression, NICE recommends SSRIs such as fluoxetine as the first choice for most people due to their good safety profile and tolerability. Tricyclic antidepressants, on the other hand, have a higher risk of danger in overdose. Lofepramine is indicated as a tricyclic antidepressant with the best safety profile. 
Antidepressants are usually taken for at least six months and for some time after symptoms remit. We will need to investigate whether the patient is ready to reduce or stop the medication. NICE advises that withdrawal symptoms can occur with a wide range of antidepressants medication, including tricyclics, SSRIs and SNRIs. It's also important to note that some commonly used antidepressants, such as paroxetine and venlafaxin, are more likely to be associated with withdrawal symptoms, so particular care is needed with them. However, fluoxetine's prolonged duration of action means that it can sometimes be safely stopped by taking 20 mg alternate days for a period of time. For people taking higher doses, such as 40 or 60 mg of fluoxetine a day, a more gradual withdrawal schedule should be used. If a person experiences withdrawal symptoms when they stop taking antidepressant medication or reduce their dose, NICE recommends reassuring them that they're not having a relapse of their depression. It's important to explain that these symptoms are common and that relapse does not usually happen as soon as the medication is stopped or the dose is lowered. Additionally, it's important to note that even if the medication is restarted or the dose is increased, withdrawal symptoms may take a few days to disappear. In summary, here are the steps we will be taking. We will start with apagliflozin at 5 mg and increase to 10 mg daily if the patient tolerates it. We will monitor the patient's blood pressure while on dapagliflozin and consider increasing the dose of lisinopril to 40 mg once daily if necessary. We will encourage the patient to attend physiotherapy and weight management support while also starting topical non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and reducing oral ibuprofen as much as possible. Any future doses of ibuprofen orally will come with gastroprotection such as omeprazole and the patient will be warned about the nephrotoxic effects of ibuprofen. We will check the patient's non-HDL cholesterol levels and consider increasing atorvastatin to 80 mg once daily if the current statin therapy has not resulted in a 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol compared to pretreatment levels. We will assess the patient's asthma control and, if needed, offer low-dose inhaled corticosteroids such as beclomethasone 100 micrograms one or two inhalations twice daily if the patient experiences asthma-related symptoms three or more times a week or wakes up at night due to asthma symptoms. Finally, we will discuss the patient's depression and assess whether she is ready to gradually discontinue fluoxetine. It is important to note that these steps will likely require multiple appointments to complete. Please keep in mind that this is only my interpretation of the patient's case and there may be alternative treatment options. Please let me know your views in the comment section below. We have come to the end of this video. I hope that you have found it useful and if so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.